In Book 2, Chapter 5, what the anima Aristotle introduces a distinction between two meanings of the idea of potentiality, which he takes to be necessary to understand what he calls the principle of life or the soul. The example with which he introduces the distinction is the twofold manner in which one can say of a human being that she is capable of theoretical understanding. Someone can be said to be capable of theoretical understanding in a sense that does not imply that she has learned and acquired any particular theoretical knowledge, such as knowledge of grammar. The reason why she can be said to be capable of theoretical understanding is not that she has, in fact, some knowledge, but that she, in being human, belongs to a species that is capable of theoretical understanding. Theoretical knowledge is a mere potentiality for her, that is, it is in no sense a reality. In another sense, someone can be said to be capable of theoretical understanding in a sense that does imply that she has, in fact, learned and acquired some knowledge. Knowledge of grammar is no longer a mere potentiality for her, but in some sense, an actuality. This does not imply that she, who is capable of theoretical understanding in this sense, does actually exercise the capacity she has acquired by studying further aspects of grammar. She might, for example, be asleep or watching a movie. There is still a sense in which her knowledge of grammar is a potentiality that is something that is not actualized, but a sense that presupposes that, there is, that knowledge uh, is also a, a, a reality for her. In recent debates about how to properly characterize the distinctive character of the human form of life or the human species, the Aristotelian distinction between these two senses of potentiality has been taken up by authors who want to emphasize the idea that the distinctive character of the human species is largely a matter of practice and education. Its most prominent contemporary version we find in the position of John McDowell, who argues that the characteristics which set human beings apart from any other non-human animal are largely part of their second nature. Paradoxically, however, the same Aristotelian distinction between two senses of potentiality has also been used by authors who want to argue for the opposite position. These authors want to argue that the distinctive character of the human species can only be understood with a notion of nature according to which the distinctive character of the human species is already and fundamentally a matter of its first nature, and this position has been defended, among others, by Michael Thompson, Philippa Foot, and Elizabeth Anscombe. Following a phrase Michael Thompson has suggested, I will call the former position sophisticated Aristotelianism and the latter position naive Aristotelianism. The debate between sophisticated and naive Aristotelianism is not a debate about what has come to be called the placement problem. It is not the question about where to place the idea of rationality in first nature or second nature, as if both parties had the same concept of first and second nature. Rather, it is a debate about how to properly understand the very idea of a human nature. In what follows, I will proceed in two steps, or three. I will first lay out the common ground of both parties of the debate by showing how both try to accommodate the same difficulty. I will then secondly point to the main objection that each position is confronted with in the eyes of the other. In the final part, I will then defend a version of naive Aristotelianism that undermines a certain conception of what it means to have a first nature that I think is the source of the debate or the confusion between them. So Aristotle defines a soul as the form of a living being qua living being. It is that which answers the question, what is it, by virtue of which this is a living being. Thus, any living being, qua living being, has a soul, according to this definition. Aristotle thinks he can distinguish between three different kinds of souls. And the notion of a form of life, as it is used by Michael Thompson, and as well as it is used by John McDowell, is meant to capture the Aristotelian idea of a soul. So the idea of a form that is 
used in the idea of a Lebensform or form of life is strictly the Aristotelian idea of a form. So, but it, nevertheless, that raises what is it a, a form of life? So, and Aristotle thinks that he can distinguish between three kinds of souls, and so we can say Aristotle thinks he can distinguish between three forms of such forms of life, and he calls them the vegetative form of life, the animal form of life, and the rational form of life. So my topic is to understand what it means to characterize the distinctiveness of the human life form in terms of its rationality, as this term figures in the formal characterization of the rational life form, or as Aristotle calls it, the Vernunftseele. Sophisticated as well as naive Aristotelianism share the idea that the Aristotelian distinction between two meanings of the idea of potentiality is the key to endorse two claims that both parties find equally compelling. You have it on the handout, uh, of, of handout of uh, Nummer zwei. So first, that the human species has a character that is formally distinctive with respect to any other species. And second, that small human children do not yet exhibit any of the capacities that typically characterize the rationality of a human grown-up, such as thinking and speaking a language, giving and asking for reasons, or keeping promises, etc. So I will first sketch how proponents of sophisticated Aristotelianism make use of the Aristotelian distinction between two meanings of the idea of potentiality in order to endorse both claims. According to sophisticated Aristotelianism, rational animals are the result of a process of education that transforms a merely sensible animal which is only potentially connected with those capacities that constitute rationality into an animal that is actually in possession of these capacities. According to this position, the term rationality designates an intrinsically self-conscious system of capacities that is, capacities that one cannot possess without being conscious of one's possession of them. According to McDowell, the paradigmatic capacity that constitutes this system of capacities is the capacity to employ concepts in judgments whose content one is able to understand and for which one is able to give reasons, ask for reasons, and take reasons. At the center of this position is the idea that the role of practice and education is to bring about a transformation from an individual that possesses this system of rational capacities merely potentially into an individual who possesses it in actuality. And here are some representative passages from McDowell where he artic articulates this position. Quotations is on number three. Human individuality is not just biological, not exhausted by the singleness of a particular human animal. A fully-fledged human individual is a free agent. Freedom is responsiveness to reasons. It is not a natural endowment, not something we are born with. The idea of participation in a communal form of life is needed for a satisfactory understanding of responsiveness to reasons. Responsiveness to reasons marks out a fully-fledged human individual as no longer a merely biological particular, but a being of a metaphysically new kind. So small children, according to this idea, are only potentially rational animals in the sense of animals who, in doing what they do, manifest a consciousness of reasons for which they do what they do. It is possible for them to become rational and self-conscious in that sense, and thereby to become a being that is no longer a merely biological particular, but a free agent. However, what they do as long as they are small children is not a manifestation of the metaphysically same kind to which they belong once they have undergone what McDowell calls participation in a communal form of life, or as I will put it shortly, once they have undergone practice and education. Two points are decisive here. Firstly, how this account describes the beginning and end of education. It begins with a merely biological particular and ends with a free agent. Metaphysically conceived, there is no difference between small children and non-human animals. The fundamental principles of their activities are described in terms of capacities that do not yet entail the above-mentioned system of capacities that constitute rationality. And secondly, how it conceives of the role of education, namely as a process that brings about a metaphysical transformation from a non-rational being into a rational being. 
So the idea that human childhood is a stage of development in which the human individual undergoes a metaphysical transformation presupposes the following thought. It presupposes that the concept of a human being describes a substantial unity that can be analyzed through a concept of animality that describes its matter and a concept of rationality that describes its form. The concept of a human being, according to this conception, is the concept of the unity of these two concepts. But how precisely are these two concepts related to one another, according to that conception? Now, sophisticated Aristotelianism thinks of this relation in a twofold way. In one respect, it thinks of it as a unity that is somehow analogous to the one we find in the relation between the form of a statue and its matter. The matter, the matter of a statue, for example, a piece of wood, is such that it can receive the form of a statue. This analogy, according to this position, holds in two important ways. For a piece of wood to receive the form of a statue, a builder is required in whom the form of the statue is operative, such that he, among others, acquires the appropriate tools and techniques that he needs for being able to give the wood this form. This is similar to the situation of a human child. For a human child to receive the form of rationality, an educator, or a common form of life, is required in whom the form of rationality is operative, such that he, or that communal form of life, among others, acquires the appropriate tools and techniques in order to give the child this form. It follows from this that it is possible for a piece of wood to never receive the form of a statue, as it is equally possible for a human child to never become rational. Yet, at the same time, sophisticated Aristotelianism wants to think of the relation between the form and matter in the case of a human being as one that is much more intimate than in the case of artifacts. The receiving of the form of rationality is the receiving of a form with which that which receives this form is already conceptually united. That which receives the form of rationality is a human being. That is, it is something that already falls under the concept whose content is analyzed in terms of animal matter and rational form. Thus, the idea of the human, according to this account, is the idea of an animal that falls under a concept that contains the concept of rationality, but not as something that any animal that falls under the concept of a human being already actualizes simply in virtue of being a human being. Rather, it is something with which the human animal is conceptually united, in that it describes the form of this animal in its fully developed stage. A human being, according to this account, falls under a concept whose full instantiation requires the transformation of a merely biological particular into a rational animal. The following two claims are thus def definitive for this conception. It is, first, it is possible to instantiate the concept of a human being without instantiating rationality. And second, Human development is the progressive actualization of a form in an animal which, as such, does not yet instantiate this form in actuality, but with which it is conceptually united. So it has this form potentially. According to this position, the idea of the human life and the idea of a rational life are distinct in meaning. Although the concept of the human life contains the concept of a rational life, it is not identical with it. For one can be a human being without being a rational animal. Now, naive Aristotelianism argues that the metaphysical kind which a fully-fledged human being instantiates is not different from the one which small children instantiate. This is so not because they think that small children are already born with those capacities that, according to sophisticated Aristotelianism, must be acquired in the course of the upbringing. Rather, this is so because they deny that the concept of a human being can be analyzed into something other than what is distinctively human. The concept of rationality which a fully-fledged human being instantiates is not the concept of a form that could also be instantiated differently. 
that is in a life that is not the human life. Rather, the concept of rationality, as it characterizes the human life, is the concept of nothing other than the concept of the human form. Bearers of the human form of life, qua being bearers of that form of life, therefore actualize this form in everything they are and do. So according to naive Aristotelianism, speaking of a rational animal or a free agent is not speaking of a kind that could have other species than the human kind. Nor is it speaking of a kind that only some human beings, namely the educated ones, instantiate in their life. Rather, it is an abstract manner of speaking of the human form of life. It is abstract in that it abstracts from those factors in virtue of which the concept of this form of life is the concept of a reality. That is the concept of individuals who manifest this form. Before I will turn our eyes to the problems that both positions are confronted with in the eyes of each other, let me first sketch the common ground. Both varieties of Aristotelianism share the idea that the, that, I'm sorry, that the distinctiveness of the human should be conceived in terms of a difference in form. This thought sets both of them in opposition to most of contemporary philosophy, for it means to deny that the anthropological difference can be captured in terms of specific capacities that a human being possesses in addition to those that non-human animals possess, which dominates most contemporary debates. The difference, they think, is one in terms of the principle of unity in virtue of which there is something that can so much as figure as a subject of a variety of vital operations. That is the principle of unity in virtue of which there is such a thing as a living being. A human being is not an animal plus intellect, but a distinctive manner of being an animal, just as an animal is not a plant plus some further capacities. So this implies the idea that the concepts that designate the vital operations of animals, such as, for example, eating, drinking, digesting, perceiving, reproducing, sleeping and being awake, etc., do not have the same meaning in the case of a rational animal as in the case of a non-rational animal. So that is the idea that there's a formal distinction between human and non-human animality. For the meaning of these concepts, according to them, is dependent upon the form of the form of life that the animal in question exhibits. So that is the idea that there are three different kinds of soul or three different forms of forms of life. Aristotle expresses this by saying that life is spoken in many ways. So what it means to be a living being is different when the individual in question exhibits a vegetative form of life. It is once again different when it exhibits an animal form of life. And it is once again different when it exhibits a rational form of life. So Aristotle's suggestion is to think of the human form of life as a rational form of life, that is, as a form of life whose uniting principle is what he calls the intellect. The debate between sophisticated and naive Aristotelianism is a debate about how to properly understand this conception. What does it mean to think of the intellect or rationality as the form of a form of life? So sophisticated Aristotelianism unfolds the idea that the intellect is the form of a distinctive form of life as follows. To think of the intellect or rationality of a form as the form of a form of life means to think that there is a form of life that is defined by individuals that are in possession of a power for concepts and judgments that unifies the vital capacities of those who possess this power into self-conscious and hence rational beings. The paradigmatic activity of these beings is judging because in judging they manifest their form of life in the manner that defines it. So the very idea of such a power 
according to this conception, does not include that this power could also be the unifying principle of completely different vital capacities than those that make up the human form of life. Of course, the human form of life is the only rational form of life that we human beings know for sure. But we cannot logically exclude that there are other species of rational life that entail vital capacities that are so far completely unknown to us and yet still have intellect. So that is how naive Aristotelianism thinks of sophisticated Aristotelianism. So according to naive Aristotelianism, this conception of rationality is incoherent. Why? Well, its premise is that the concept of rationality is the concept of a power that does not contain any specific conception of the conditions of its actualization. It is the concept of a power which, as such, does not contain any specific understanding of how this concept describes a reality. What is required for this power for judging and concepts to be actualized in a variety of acts is not yet contained in the understanding of this power qua power. Rather, this understanding of the power for concepts and judgments, namely as something that is indeed actualized in some specific life activity, requires that we think of this power as the form of a specific matter, for example, earthly animal matter. If we think of this power as the form of earthly animal matter, then for all we have learned about this matter, practice and education are needed for this power to be actualized in an individual that is constituted by such matter. So according to naive Aristotelianism, sophisticated Aristotelianism is committed to think that the fact that a human individual needs practice and education for fully instantiating the human form of life is a contingent fact about these individuals. It is a fact that humans had to learn about themselves. This account of the Aristotelian doctrine, however, is they argue, incoherent. It is incoherent because it cannot characterize the role of practice and education in human life in a non-paradoxical way. Because on the one hand, it is committed to think of the claim a human being has to practice and be educated in order to fully instantiate its form as an empirical claim about humans that could have been otherwise. However, the objection goes, if one thinks of this claim as an empirical claim about human beings, one cannot hold on to the truth of this claim without at the same time denying the possibility of its content. For to think of it as a true claim would mean to think that there could not have been a human individual that actualizes the form of rationality before there had been education. However, if there was no human individual that actualizes the form of rationality before there had been education, then there could not have been education in the first place. Since education presupposes that those who educate others do already actualize the very form that is the content of education. Thus, for being able to understand so much as the possibility of education, whose necessity one wants to claim, this doctrine has to deny the truth of this claim. Namely, that education is not necessary. So according to naive Aristotelianism, the failure of this account results, or the incoherence of this uh, account, results from the idea that it is logically possible to disentangle the concept of the intellect as it characterizes the form of a form of life from the concept of the human form of life. This is impossible 
this disentanglement, if one understands the idea that the intellect is the form of a form of life in the right way. So what does it mean to understand it in the right way? To understand it in the right way means to deny that the intellect is a capacity, let alone a capacity that can be actualized differently depending on the specific matter whose form it is. The idea of the intellect conceived as the form of a form of life is not the idea of an individual capacity, neither one among many nor a fundamental one. Rather, it is the idea of a formal feature of a form of life that it specifies in terms of its manner of actualization. It characterizes the form of life that it specifies as a rational one. It characterizes the form of life that it specifies as one that actualizes itself through a consciousness of itself. So self-consciousness, according to this account, is not a power of which it can be asked how an individual living being comes into possession of, because it characterizes a specific manner of being an individual in the first place. Being the bearer of a rational life form means to be an individual that instantiates her life form in virtue of having a consciousness of her life form. It will become more clearly what that means in what follows. If we conceive of the idea of self-consciousness and hence rationality in this manner, then it is impossible to think of a rational form of life as a genus of which there can be more than one species. This is impossible because it means to think of a rational form of life as a form of life whose concept is and must be, qua concept of such a form of life, dependent upon individuals who think of themselves as instantiations of this form of life and hence of its concept. It is a form of life whose fundamental form of thinking about it is the first person. So that is what is a self-conscious form of life. So according to naive Aristotelianism, this is the formal concept of a rational form of life. It is formal in that it does not contain those factors that are contained in the concept of this form of life qua being the concept of a reality. The concept of a rational form of life that would contain those factors would be its material concept. And Michael Thompson argues that the concept of the human life form is nothing other than that. It is the material concept of a rational form of life. Its material concept differs from its formal concept, not in that the letter describes the genus of which the human life form describes a species. It differs in that the concept of the human contains those articulations of this concept in virtue of which the concept of a rational life form is intelligible as the concept of a reality. Now one might ask, what could possibly be the basis of the claim that the concept of the human is the material concept of a rational life form? Well, if the concept of the human has the form that we described above, then the basis of this claim must be and can only be one's recognition of forms of consciousness in which individuals, including oneself, represent themselves as instantiations of such a form of life, whose very concept is dependent upon these forms of self-representation. For the concept of a rational form of life, according to this account, describes a reality if and only if there are individuals that represent themselves, their capacities and activities, as instantiations of such a form of life.
McDowell thinks that judging is the paradigmatic activity of self-consciousness. As we can see now, this is right, because it is part of the very concept of a rational life form that one cannot determine its content independently of an employment of this concept in judgments by those who think themselves as instantiations of it. It is indeed in judging that human beings fully instantiate their form of life. But it is a misunderstanding to conclude from this that an individual that is not yet able to judge is not self-conscious. Rather, the opposite holds. Only a being that is self-conscious in a less than conceptual sense can come to articulate this self-consciousness in a manner that entails an employment of concepts in judgments. Judging is a paradigmatic activity of individuals who exhibit a self-conscious form of life because it is the very activity by which the individual determines the content of the concept of her form of life, which could not, would not have any content if it were not determined in that manner. And this capacity for judging is indeed acquired through practice and education because it is through practice and education that a human being acquires specific concepts and capacities through which she herself comes to be able to determine and hence understand and articulate, articulate the content of her consciousness. But practice and education is nothing other than the shape that the exercise of capacities take whose form is self-consciousness. That the, is, and that are exercised in a human environment. That is, in an environment of other human beings in which some of them will simply be there, some will occasionally talk to her, and others will occasionally show her how to do things. So that which explains why the actualization of a rational form of life through an individual necessarily takes the shape of practice and education is thus nothing other than its form. It has this shape because that is what it means to actualize a self-conscious form when one is not yet fully instantiating it and in virtue of which one becomes precisely that, a being that fully instantiates it. This is so because the activities of a being who exhibits a self-conscious form of life consist in an exercise of capacities in, in an environment in virtue of which each exercise as such makes a contribution to the content of the consciousness she has of her form of life. Because of that contribution that each exercise of her capacities makes to the content of her consciousness, this consciousness will gradually come to take the form of concepts and judgments by means of which this consciousness can think of herself as an individual instantiation of the form of life that she herself is conscious of. Think, for example, of the joy that any human child experiences once she acquired the capacity to walk, for which she has practiced so many months. This is clearly an expression that she has not just learned walking, but that her walking entails a conception of what walking is, and that she herself finally can bring herself under that conception. More, and moreover, that she is now part of the walking community. That she finally can do what we do. So there seems to be so, yeah, so, 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 so that, that, that is the picture of naive Aristotelianism. So. But there seems to be an objection against this account that can and has often been expressed as follows. Naive Aristotelianism misunderstands the role of education in the life of a human being because it endorses a kind of essentialism. It thinks that the nature of a human being, although it is formally different from the nature of any non-human being in that it is self-conscious, is nevertheless similar to it in that it is something that is prior to and independent from not only what the individual human being thinks about the human life, 
but also prior to and independent from how the individual human lives her life. Just as the nature of a dog is something that is prior to and independent from what this particular dog thinks and does, so, that is the objection, according to this picture, is human nature. Sophisticated Aristotelianism vividly rejects this picture. It thinks that this picture deeply misunderstands the formal character of the difference between non-human animals and human beings. The formal difference between them, they think, is that the nature of a human being is not something that is exhausted by its being given to its individuals, but something that is largely dependent on the life of this individual, on its education and activities. Education is not the unfolding of an already given nature of a human being, but the bringing about of a new nature, a second nature, within the human being. So I think an object along these lines is the main motive for why one thinks that the only viable form of Aristotelianism can be the sophisticated one. In the reminder... Very short, I will argue, that a properly understood naive Aristotelianism is not only not open to this objection, but entails a forceful refutation of the kind of view with which it is falsely identified. Why so? Naive Aristotelianism denies the premise on which this objection rests. It denies that the formal distinctiveness of a rational form of life is specified in terms of a power that its individuals have. It does not think that of the intellect as an inborn power because it does not think of the intellect as an individual power at all. A rational form of life, we have said, is a form of life that is actualized through a consciousness of itself. This means that it is a form of life whose concept has no content independently of the consciousness that those who instantiate it have of this form of life. So the concept of a rational form of life is a concept whose content is dependent upon individuals who represent themselves as instantiations of a form of life and hence of a concept whose content they determined through that form of self-representation. So according to a properly conceived naive Aristotelianism, one cannot grasp the formal distinctiveness of a rational form of life without denying that there is any sense in which it can be said that an individual of such a form of life relates to its form of life as to something given. I think we can see the misunderstanding of the objection more clearly once we finally come to see how a properly understood naive Aristotelianism understands the distinction between the two senses of potentiality that we began with and that Aristotle employs in his account of the development of living beings. According to naive Aristotelianism, the sense of this distinction is dependent on the life form that the individual in question manifests. There is no general understanding of the sense of this distinction, that is, of what kind of development it describes, independently of the form of life to which it is applied. This is so because that which distinguishes one form of life formally from another is precisely the manner, the manner in which it actualizes itself in a living individual. In the case of an animal form of life, the manner in which the life form actualizes itself in a living individual is through the senses. It is by perceiving things that belong to their form of life that they instantiate their form of life. It is through his perception of a gazelle that a lion does what lions generally do when they see a gazelle. He hunts it and eats it. 
Now the senses have organs. They, this explains why the development of a lion from a stage where he does not yet fully actualize his life form into a stage of full actualization has the shape of what we call biological maturation. The point of the distinction between two senses of potentiality in application to an individual that manifests an animal form of life is thus to describe two stages of a process of biological maturation, beginning from a stage where a capacity is not yet ready for use into a stage where it is ready for use. By contrast, when the distinction is applied to a rational form of life, then the sense of the distinction is different. Because now it is applied to a form of life whose actualization in an individual consists in an exercise of capacities within a human environment of which each exercise, in virtue of its very form, contributes to the consciousness the individual has of her form of life. Because of that contribution to her consciousness, the development of an individual that does not yet fully instantiate her form of life into a stage where she is a fully-fledged individual of her form of life, as a matter of necessity, has the shape of practice and education. This is so not because she otherwise did not become fully rational, but because this simply is the shape that the activities of a rational being have that does not yet fully instantiate its form of life. This is what it means for them to be a living being. This allows the naive Aristotelian to combine the two claims made at the beginning, namely that a human being has a formally distinctive form with the claim that a human child does not yet manifest those rational activities that a fully-fledged human being manifests, such as speaking a language or judging, giving reasons or keeping promises. The acquisition of any particular rational capacity is indeed a matter of practice and education in the sense specified above. But the intellect conceived as the consciousness of the form of life whose form this consciousness is, is not the result of practice and education. It is its form. As its form, it characterizes the totality of the activities of a human being, including those when it is a child when this form gives her activities the shape of practice and, and education. Elizabeth Anscomb makes, I think, precisely this point when she claims in her paper on human essence that the fact, I quote, that a newborn baby is speechless is the same sort of fact as a newborn kitten's being blind. End of quote. It is the same sort of fact in that a newborn baby's coming to speak one day will be nothing other than the result of her natural development, if that is not impeded. Just as the coming to see of a kitten will be the result of its natural development, if that is not impeded. However, what it is to naturally develop that means something very different for the baby than what it means for the kitten. Thank you. <laughs>